Good evening, Dungeon Masters, I'm Baron Durop. Matthew Colville's recent self-labeled rant, Language, Not Rules, details why rules don't need to be illustrated for every possible situation, and why having a lightweight yet predictable rule set allows Dungeon Masters to adjudicate on the fly. And I agree with all of his points. However, there is something Colville missed. Rules aren't just a language to be inferred during story narration. Rules also serve as a contract to reinforce a game's narrative. And breaching this narrative contract leads players to feel antagonized or like their trust is violated by the dungeon master. Let me illustrate what I mean by this narrative contract. To do this, I'll analyze two different RPGs which both market themselves as grindhouse horror D&D retro clones. Dungeon Crawl Classics, and Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Both of these games will feel immediately familiar to any modern D&D player, as the concepts of character race, class, levels, spells, and combat mechanics are all roughly the same. However, Dungeon Crawl Classics has additional rules which specifically facilitate the feeling of a low-budget horror film. Instead of character creation, players randomly generate as many as a dozen characters and run them through a slaughterhouse adventure. From these survivors, players decide which character will be their main, and thusly it will be given its first class level. Before this level is gained, characters aren't any more powerful than emaciated dung farmers. Dungeon Crawl Classics has further rules describing the wild unpredictability of magic, what happens to your fragile weapon on a attack's critical failure, and the gruesome horrors which befall your character when they're struck with a critical hit. All these rules sum for a narrative experience that replicates a fantasy version of films like Bloodsucking Freaks, Hobo with a Shotgun, or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Contrast this with Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and you'll find no rules reinforcing this kind of narrative. In fact, the author's introduction in the core rules specifically states it's up to the Dungeon Master to create the gruesome, perverted, and horror core tone that the game's marketing claims to have. Of course, reading the rules reveals the game is little more than a copy of OSE, Osric, or Swords and Wizardry. Therefore, its publication is simply an excuse to create a retro clone D&D special edition, now with X-rated, red-headed Morticia Adams artwork. Even ignoring its former lead artist's sexual assault controversy, the Lamentations rule set is morally bankrupt of its goal narrative tone. As a result, a dungeon master may find themselves in an effort to create that tone, asking for checks or creating penalties that aren't explicitly reinforced by the rules. Charisma saves versus madness when coming upon a horrific scene might make sense in the moment, and even be in line with the game's core mechanics, but players who have no expectation of these checks due to the absence of the rules supporting them might feel at best misled, or at worst like the Dungeon Master is on a power trip. Conversely, players who belly up to a game of Dungeon Crawl Classics already understand that getting struck with a critical hit might result in losing a limb. Meanwhile, telling a Lamentations player their character loses a finger, even for the sake of narrative, has a high risk to leading to resentment. So let's look at this problem from 10,000 feet. The medium is the message, is a concept penned by communication philosopher Marshall McLuhan. To quickly summarize, McLuhan posits that a medium used to communicate, in this case the RPG's rules, is more impactful to the people communicating, the players, than any particular story they share with that medium. As a thought experiment, have you ever noticed how your living room furniture doesn't face each other, but instead faces the television? That might sound silly or obvious at first, but the existence of your television and your desire to watch it has a direct impact on how you arrange your living room. In contrast, there isn't a singular television-based creative work that causes us to have a specific furniture layout. Not even Breaking Bad, Blade Runner, or Bioshock has dictated where you put your couch. To return to RPGs then, what implications does a rule set like 5th edition D&D, Dungeon Crawl Classics, or Lamentations of the Flame Princess have on our game's narrative? To answer that question, and to return to Colville's rant, we can group RPG rules into three categories. Contest resolution, 
crunch, and the narrative contract. These classifications are kind of vague and sometimes overlap, so this isn't a strict classification, but once you're familiar with them, you can know each one of them when you see it. Contest resolution is exactly what it sounds like. These are the mechanics that make the game work. Two hit and skill check bonuses, armor class, spell saves, these are all examples of contest resolution mechanics in D&D. The important part is that they are foundational, and in well-designed games, they're consistent. Secondly, crunch mechanics are the rules the lawyers in the room love to nitpick over. Multi-classing, damage type stacking, and the ways a myriad of abilities interplay with each other are all examples of this. These might be fun for Reddit players to discuss, but they usually do little to keep the game moving. It's these rules specifically Colville says are not worth fretting over, and to be clear, I completely agree with him. But this is where we come to the third kind of rule, the narrative contract. In 5th edition D&D, this, in part, is the abilities that define each character class. In Dungeon Crawl Classics, these are those spell mishap and critical hit tables that cause fortune or failure to your character's life and limb. In Lamentations of the Flame Princess, well, the narrative contract isn't really any different to 5th edition, and this horrorcore rule mismatch highlights Colville's oversight. Failure to appreciate or respect these narrative reinforcing rules completely destabilizes the player's anchoring in the game's thematic motif. In contrast, changes to the conflict resolution system, so long as they're done consistently, will only be jarring to the rule's lawyers. Contrarily, robbing a class of its prescribed abilities, the very abilities that define how that character class impacts the story, disrupts the trust players have in a predefined narrative contract. Additionally, dungeon masters who call for woes to befall their players outside of the confines of these narrative reinforcing rules will leave players feeling duped or cheated out of their autonomous experience. In the sci-fi horror RPG Mothership, for example, classes only have abilities which relate to how their characters respond to fear, while the impacts of this fear as a mechanic are almost always bad. Each class has a unique method of saving themselves or their party members from this fear. Doing anything to disrupt these fear-based mechanics and therefore the emergent narrative prompted by them completely disrupts the RPG's sci-fi horror tone. So if you decide to go fast and loose with the rules just to keep the story moving, it's important to recognize which rules it's acceptable to be fast and loose with. Of course, a dungeon master can skip over the math needed to see how fast a wizard's fireball consumes a thatched roof cottage. It's obviously a goner. But should that same dungeon master be fast and loose with the action economy mechanics when there's a character making death saves? That slow bleed out from unconsciousness to the afterlife is the meta narrative of 5th edition D&D character death. It's worth looking up the rules and interrupting combat just to be sure you get that right so the players continue trusting you and the story. Thanks for watching, Dungeon Masters, and until next time, good night.